Hi, I'm Craig Tumler from Startup Stories, and I'm here uh, with Michelle Melbourne from uh, Intellidox uh, to talk about her 20 year journey as a startup. Yeah, it's a bit longer than that, actually, Craig. Yeah, so, how, how long's it been now? Well, since 1992. Wow. 1991, 1992. Okay. Yeah. So 25 years. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of all I know. Yeah, so, so what was it like? Um, how did you go about founding the company in the first place? Yeah, well, um, the, the, the first thing you need to know is that my husband and I are a, are a team, obviously, and we founded the company together. So Phil Williamson, who's our CEO, is our co-founder, um, and we've been married for 25 years and in business together for 25 years. So it's a pretty special and interesting relationship, mm. interesting dynamic in terms of leadership. Um, you know, under the hood, um, how we run the company, um, and it, essentially our lives and our, our business are intertwined. So, mm. and so far it's going really well. No, that's right. So after twenty five years, you think we've got it sorted out. You found a way to make it work, which is yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. So, so why did you find, found the company? What led you to? Okay, so um, it, it's a great question. We're, we're both scientists, mm-hmm. so Phil and I both went to the Australian National University. And Canberra and studied science so if you know if you kind of hang around people like that they're the kind of people that question everything so they always have a million questions and how come this and how come that and um, in the late 90s scientists weren't kind of trendy or you know nerds and people who were really interested in finding out how things work really were you know the lab coat kind of yes. people that um, you know, we're yet to, to find their place in, in the world. And so um, you couldn't really get a job as a professional in, with a science degree. Um, and so practically where that lands is that most scientists are, are in the business of asking questions and gathering information, gathering data and evidence. And so um, my logic is that you're always dealing with data. Yes. Data is the, the core of everything in this world. So you need to create algorithms and create, if you like, reports and evidence of a body of work that says, I make this hypothesis and here's my evidence to support what I think is true. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's the basis science, of science the scientific process. Yeah, right. Yeah. So we assume something yes. and essentially you try and disprove it hmm. by collecting data and saying, well, you know, okay, that's the current state of what we believe what we think you know the world is flat <laughs> so let's gather evidence and talk to people and and the people who are doing the research and collect the evidence get some new evidence anyway so long story short is that we're fascinated by technology and fascinated by how um, software and technology could help in in business processes mm-hmm. um, So my degree was primarily in psychology, um, rats, stats and dats, we used to call it. So (laughs) people and technology is what I've been passionate about all my life. It's kind of all I know. My dad was an engineer and he um, was one of the early professions that used computing power to Mm -hmm. um, compute, you know, punch cards and, you know, put all this data in and ping a week later or something, you know, the the supercomputer would provide an answer. And he was using that for mapping and spatial data. Right. And so when I was doing my, my degree at university, he said to me, oh, you should do some computer science units, Shelley. They, they might come in handy one day. That was a very smart call, I think. And that was in 1987. Yeah, so, that's, that's a very smart call back then. Right. Mm-hmm. So Fortran, Prolog. Yes. Um, early, you know, um, SQL kind of platforms, mm-hmm. um, Unix, that kind of stuff. So um, had enough of a grounding in that to really understand how it all works um, and realise that all those people that were in that, in that room were my tribe. Yes. They're my people. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I was drawn to them. And my husband is a biochemist mm-hmm. by degree. So, um, you know, deconstructing how things work at a molecular level mm-hmm. um, and, you know, reconstructing it for, um, you know, the future, if you like. So Science 101. So intensely curious about everything and passionate about people in technology. So how did that lead you to the business? Well, um, 
it, there was so much opportunity at that time. So in the late 90s, um, it was pre-Windows. Actually, sorry, the oh, late 80s. 80s. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> no, I'm thinking 1989. <laughs> so the late 80s was uh, pre-Windows. Hmm. Um, so was it, there was this massive kind of uptake of, of personal computing is yes. probably the way you would describe it. So out of the labs of, of you know, big computing power um, onto people's desktops. So mm. there was this groundswell of a revolution of, of PCs, you know, Osborne computers and, and those kind of guys. Well, and I remember the Amigas and other things because right. that, that was also of when course. I was getting into computers and yeah. programming as right. well. Right, and the early Apples yes. were yes. around, so the two E's and... Um, and so there was this, this, this people power mm -hmm. at, at the personal computing level and who knew where that was going to lead. Um, but, but technology companies were starting to, to really um, get some good uh, traction in the marketplace. Um, Apple obviously, Microsoft uh, were going really well. And so, but they were still kind of fringe and they were yes. still uncertain where their place in the market was. It was yeah. still disruptive. And, and it's really interesting because, you know, I say to you that we're a start, we're a 25 year startup. We've reinvented ourselves every year for the last 25 years. If we were doing even today, the same thing that we were doing this time last year, we would be out of business. So I argue that the technology industry is, um, and it always has been. So this digital disruption piece is old news for anyone who knows what they're doing yes. in the technology space. It's just the pace and the breadth of technology options that are now available um, is obviously growing logarithmically. Yes. And the, and the accessibility of, of, of software solutions and the price point and all that kind of stuff. It's much easier to opt in now. So in answer to your question, um, why did we start the business back then is that we could just see the massive potential for um, corporate use of, of enterprise software. Okay, so your husband and you were already together? Uh, well, no. So ironically, mm -hmm. we studied at, at the university at kind of almost the same time and yep. similar degrees. Um, but we met after, I was still at uni and he'd already finished. Mm -hmm. And we met, ironically, we were introduced um, to each other by a senior executive at Apple. Oh, wow. Who was our mutual friend. Right. There you go. Oh, wow, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so it was always meant to be. Yeah, and what was the original idea around the company? What were you trying to achieve? Right, well, we had, um, so we, we, look, there was no plan. There's no mm -hmm. magic strategy, you know, and, and um, it was just a case of you kind of felt your instinct was that this is great. You're know, passionate about it. Um, I, look, Phil was working for a, a software, a networking company, essentially. It was a LAN you know, local area network uh, company. Um, uh, you probably remember Comtech yes, Communications. Yes. So it's it, these early guys that were dealing with Novell Netware mm -hmm. and you know all that kind of stuff, um, and hooking up computers in in, in businesses yeah, so well, that they could talk to each other and well, share software. Well, that was enormously disruptive at the time as well. It, it was going from standalone to a network. Correct. Totally changed the face of computing. Totally. Again. Right. Yeah. So totally. So disruption 101 and executives and leadership going, oh my God, how do my staff deal with this? Um, and so we were just lucky. We were the right place, the right time with um, you know, people on the ground who, who understood that technology is all about people mm -hmm. and not about the code. Yes. Um, and it's about how organisations can ingest innovation. And it still is to this very day. Um, and so we were fortunate enough to work um, with a company in Sydney um, as consultants. Mm -hmm. so, so we were selected because we had the ability to articulate um, a, a change management and people management. And obviously with my degree in psychology, um, it really came naturally to me. Yes. Um, and I was lucky enough to be given the opportunity to be in the boardroom of executives from Telstra and Commonwealth Bank at mm -hmm. that time, advising them on their technology strategy. Great. So, so ostensibly I was there with a technology hat on, mm -hmm. but I knew it, it, it's what we today call change management. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So helping them to um, uh, create programs where their, their teams weren't alarmed by this change in desktop computing and that the 
they were literally transforming the tea lady, the concept of a tea lady in a large corporate. You know, a lady, a woman that would roll around a trolley yes. for morning and afternoon tea and give out tea to the staff. You think, what? Low value work, but highly regarded mm. inside the organisation as, as a sacrosanct function inside an organisation, but, but obviously redundant. Yes. yes. Yeah. Well, the, well, the ABC ended up naming one of its buildings after uh, one of its tea ladies. tea ladies. Right. Yes. So highly, right. so I say this sacred cow, if I can say mm. that, it's like, wow, you know, and disruption just puts pressure on those low value jobs in any large and complex organisation. And so how to retrain these wonderful, wonderful, loyal employees, how to, how to give them higher duties. Yeah. So how to teach yep. them to use a computer, um, how to teach them to be really useful in terms of doing the business of that organisation. Yes. Um, right. So mm -hmm. automation in, at, at that point in time and retraining um, you know, people for higher value duties using technology. So same thing to this very day. Okay. People that deal with paperwork and forms and processing applications and things like that, it's low value work. Mm. Um, yes. and, and, and these people need to be redeployed to higher duties and, and, and let a, a digital process take care of the 80% of the load of, of a process where it can be automated. Yeah, so, so given you've reinvented your business so many times from, you know, basically it was a consulting business back then. Correct. Now you're more of a product and service with yeah. some consulting business. Correct. So what's the shape of, of IntelliDocs today? Today, all right. So we employ 45 people now mm -hmm. um, on a full-time basis, all inside the company as employees um, and all around the world. Our heart, very proudly, um, is here in Canberra in Australia. Our global headquarters is here. This city has been very, very good to us, um, and we find that um, we have access to so very special, um, intellectually, um, uh, you know, massive horsepower of, of global thinkers that hang out in Canberra, and we yes. kind of find them, um, and also good people. So people who care about their families and their health, and it's this lovely, holistic kind of person that we like to hire. Um, and we are now really focused on um, our, our company as a vendor. Um, so we, we aren't a services company. Mm -hmm. um, we're under a lot of pressure to provide, you know, lots and lots of services. But we put that into the channel. So yes. we work with a strategic set of partners, mm -hmm. um, tier one partners, tier two partners and tier three partners. Um, so we have global um, reseller and consulting um, arrangements with the, the top above the line advisory firms around the world, um, as well as the top systems integrators yep. around the world. That's an interesting convergence of roles as well in that market, um, as well as the specialists. So yep. the boutique uh, business process improvement consulting firms who really, um, you know, in the past they've been agnostic to yes. a solution but now you know they're advising so many firms and they see so many failures of the tier one mm -hmm. large stack technology solutions that um, a lot of the above the line advisors are actually coming down to play below the line that's fantastic and they will actually advise where you know there is a good solution to advise so we're really excited that these 25 years of persisting in the market that we have a very strong brand um, we are specialists uh -huh. um, and, um, you know, we're getting the attention of the Gartners and IDCs and Foresters, um, you know, without us having to pay the subscription fees that you know, well, yes. we pay yes. to get their attention. But, um, you know, they're, they're hearing about our success. We're just quietly getting about being successful. Um, so. Yeah, and you've broken into the North American market, which is yeah. hard for Australian companies to do yeah. um, in Europe and Asia as well. Yeah. Um, so what have been some of the biggest challenges you've had over the last 25 years as you've <laughs> sort of grown and made the transition right. from, you know, early stage startup to, I suppose you're a later stage startup. We are, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're an experienced company mm -hmm. now. Yeah, so I think we've officially um, grown from being a small company to a mid-size company mm -hmm. um, and persistent. So, um, yeah, I think we're off our training wheels. 
But, like I said, I mean, we're still doing something new every single day. Obviously, as you would expect, we're um, very aggressively exploring the new transaction models, um, you know, service in the cloud, no software license fees, Mm -hmm. no lock-in, so transaction-based pricing for Mm -hmm. the use of our software. Um, It's going very, very well. Ironically, um, the Asian market and the American market is a is a, la- a laggard in some regard. Right. In that uptake of that, so as as Australian technologists, we often think that Asia and and America is streets ahead of us, but they're actually not. Mm. Because of our compliance and regulatory environment here, um, and our very strong regulated uh, financial services and government sectors. Um, it, it actually drives the supply chain in those markets to be far more sophisticated than they are in the rest of the world. So, you know, the financial um, insurance yes. banking sector in the US isn't as heavily regulated as it is in Australia. Yeah, they're, they're a lot more, um, I don't know, chaotic. They're very... Cha- chaotic is probably yes. right. I mean, yes. I mean there's, you know, it's pretty hard to regulate such a large oh, yes. um, and, and disparate uh, yes. market. And then in Asia, you have a lot of uh, mixed markets, which aren't, you know, fully capitalistic. There's a lot of, you know, either family-based sort of approaches or they've still got yeah. a legacy of, yeah. you know, older yeah. forms of government. So for one reason or another, mm. um, because of, you know, we moan about it a lot, but because of our regulatory and compliance environment here, it's so uh, honest and so robust, is that in the supply chain, you've got to have really good technology. To, mm-hmm. to be able for, for your customer to buy your technology platform so they can be compliant. Yeah. Right. So so what that has done is it's it's helped us to create a, a, a gold medal product that immediately when we put it into an international market, it's up there competing against the tier one products. Yeah. Um, so that's fantastically exciting for us. So we have no problem in getting our technology to the the last stage of a due diligence um, procurement exercise. No, that's great. The challenge for us us is we're a small company from Australia. Mm -hmm. Um, And so so that's the paradigm that, um, you know, we've got to overcome and and Australians need to overcome that by supporting Australian technology. So on on the demand and the supply side, if we consume each other's technology and, and, not assume that something from the US or from overseas is going to be better because it's not. It yeah. really isn't. I know a number of Australian startups who sell a lot more of their product in, in European and, and North American yeah, markets. Can't, can't, can't sell it here yeah. in Australia because Australian yeah. companies say, no, nope, we've got to buy it from overseas yeah. because overseas is safe. It's just not. No. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we've had a really, really strong landing in the US. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't just go to the US and be successful. No. Um, we, you know, unless you've got a suitcase f- with about five million bucks in it and you're prepared to kind of just set fire to it, um, then you have to be really careful. Yes. Um, and you have to, um, I believe, just do things in small bite-sized chunks. Um, so we entered the, the, the North American market via Toronto. Mm-hmm. So it's actually um, the ability for us to send you know, a bunch of our best guys from Canberra to Toronto. Yes. Um, it, it, it's cost effective. Um, it's easy to get the employment rights to hire people and they can enter the U.S., you know, um, obviously within yeah. the laws of the country. And, and Canada is a little bit more similar to us as yeah. a market than yeah, the US is. So it's, a, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's an easier connection. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and essentially we sent those guys and they did a fantastic job. They were Australians and we mm-hmm. sent them there. Um, and they did the, they laid the foundations for, for the success that, you know, we see evidence today in our press releases with our wins, right? But it took them four years of... Yeah. Of spade work and you know digging trenches and 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 you know blasting out the 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 bedrock and laying the reinforcement and pouring the concrete and then digging it up when it wasn't in the right spot and putting it back in again they had to be there you you (laughs) can't be i don't think you can be successful in north america without having a permanent presence there and the same in asia very much yeah Yeah. and and we did that all through organic Mm self-funding self-funding um 
So for better or for worse, you know, we've, we've done it ourselves. And at many times we could have just turned around and said it's not working. Yes. Yeah, we've, we've had modest success. Wow, it's not working. We keep coming second, you know, and our feedback is our technology was brilliant. Um, not rates number one, but you're an Australian company and you're way, way, way away from the US. <laughs> and so we'll go with... The locals. The local company, which is fine. You know, we understand that. So every time we just learn, use it as a learning experience. Mm -hmm. Just just persistent and consistent and tenacious in saying, all right, well, so next time we need to partner with that local company. Yes. So you have to keep picking yourself up and learning. Learn, learn, learn. Or just be determined that you'll break through if you believe. Yeah. So you've got to know your market. Yes. So what, what other challenges have you sort of faced in your, in your growth over the years? Uh, look, I mean, Employment 101 is always a challenge. So it, 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 employing people is something that um, I've been very passionate about and taken applied a lot of heart to how the company does it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we employ the best people, uh, absolutely. They're a world-class team. So we don't take any, we don't compromise mm -hmm. in that regard. So our team is, is, is quite compact in that regard. Yes. Um, and so, you know, one person is kind of worth five in any other company. Um, and, we, and we fiercely protect that. And, and yeah. so as we've, as we've globalised, it's a massive challenge to protect that, mm. that culture and continue to um, um, make that culture pervasive. So yeah. that, that's definitely one of the challenges that we're facing right now. Well, as a, as a psychologist, you've kind of got a little bit of a head start on how to design and sustain a culture as well, yeah. which a lot of startups, I think, struggle with because they basically just go on, we need to hire the best, you know, the best IT talent, the best you know, science talent, all the best subject matter experts, the best salesperson, and they end up having their, losing their culture mm. or, or having it become something that is not conducive of this, to their success. Yeah. So balancing that, I, I think that culture with the, the, the smart people is, is a hard thing to do. It is, yeah, it is. Yeah. And, and it's, a, you've heard me say it a few times already, so it's all about the heart mm -hmm. and, and the person with those skills. So that you can't separate them. They have to have the heart for what we do mm -hmm. um, and the skills also yes. that we need. Yeah, so you can't have one without the other. No. Well, you won't get a job here <laughs> if you have one without the other mm. so I've, I've interviewed plenty of clever people with the skills but not with the true heart mm. so yeah they don't get through yeah and and look, good people um, they just wouldn't um, thrive in our environment yeah yeah they need to be in a bigger company or you know in a public sector job or something right fit. Yeah. Mm. yeah okay so um looking back what would you have done differently over <laughs> the life of the company well, look, I don't have any regrets, and um, I, you know, we're always talking about capital. Yeah, Australian technology companies, and certainly ones that are experienced and um, and uh, sustainable, are undercapitalized. Yes. Yeah. So there's this massive, massive underservicing of the Australian technology uh, innovation sector. We all know that. We've we've been yes. campaigning for it for many years. But here's the irony is that I don't think, you know, a $10 million injection of capital or a $20 million injection of capital would have necessarily changed our course over, you know, if we had have got that 10 years ago or five years ago or whatever. Because I think, um, and this is kind of a, a, a question for debate really, is it's the struggle that makes it matter. Yeah, it's the everyday struggle that, that we embrace here at IntelliDocs to be the best to beat our competition, to have the greatest technology, to delight our customers. Um, I think if we if we had a bit more cash, we'd be fat and lazy, and and you might lose <laughs> sight of yes. what really matters, mm -hmm. and that is being able to give someone an invoice or automatic automated invoice, and for them to be delighted to pay that that service fee yes. because they value greatly the service that you're providing for them. Yeah, I've, I've spoken so to a few startups who said that. Yeah, yeah I need someone to invoice. 
Well, 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 they've said we would love to have had more money, but we worry that if we had more money, we wouldn't have actually put in as much work or we would have been distracted or Correct. other people's interests yeah, would have yeah. guided our development. You got it. And okay, we wouldn't so have that, gone where we So want. that is exactly what I mean. Yes. Um, and, I, and I've um, seen plenty of companies who have received government funding for commercialisation or innovation. And with the greatest respect to all parties involved, I, I challenge the statistics to show that that's been a successful strategy. Yes. I would suggest most of those companies got fat and lazy um, and, and went down a rabbit hole um, and never had anyone to invoice. Yeah, they were living yes. off the grant funding or they were really focused on the milestones and the, and the reporting that was around the funding mm. obligation. Yeah, which is, which is fair enough. That's the paradigm that was set up. But, um, you know, and many companies have been successful in commercialising ads. So don't get me wrong. I'm not oh, saying yes. that's wrong. Oh, yes. What certainly the circumstance that our company was in with a mature product in the market was I'd rather a project. Mm -hmm. I'd, rather, I'd rather the grant to be called a trial project or a yes. pilot project with a customer, um, you know, and, and, and perhaps the, the grant funding is actually co-funding of a pilot of hmm. something. Yeah, and you have a you have an a outcome. defined outcome. Right. At I the want end of it. I yeah. want that customer to give me feedback. I want us to be able to adapt and listen to what that customer is doing and thinking and feeling. And I want um, I want them to be using it in anger. I want them to be um, uh, prepared to write a case study and a reference for us. Mm -hmm. um, and that there is a commercial transaction that yeah. says I would pay money for that product. Yeah. off the shelf which yeah. is sort of the next step you know because they talk about dumb money and a lot of grants money is dumb money because yeah. it's just put in then there's yeah. smart money where you get some expertise and yeah. some networks and access along with that and then there's actually i suppose you know customer style money where people are actually paying you to deliver what you are trying to deliver and that's yeah. that's the best kind of money because it it validates or it invalidates what you're delivering yeah exactly mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's a very immediate validation. Yeah. And, and so that really, what you just said, comes back to our whole 25-year journey, is everything that we do is validated by listening to the market and responding and adapting to what the market needs our software to do. Yeah. Um, and so, it, you know, even in three months' time, our, our, the users that are using the version of our technology that was in the market a year ago, you know, would be shaking, shaking that tree and saying, upgrade, upgrade. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, have you taken uh, investment throughout the twenty-five years? We have yes. a modest amount of investment. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Modest. And so that's mostly just to you know build your base. Yeah. Look, we had some fantastic have some fantastic angel investors in mm -hmm. the business um, from early on. Yes. Uh, and they are. Um, there were two of them are the founding fathers of technology industry in Canberra, mm -hmm. um, and so we're deeply grateful to them for recognizing in us something yes you know whatever that might be so um definitely um you know their kind of pocketbook helped us there um and over the years you know we have had a range of offers of of um you know full exit or mm -hmm. um investment but we've been holding on to the value of our our ip for as long as we can um, about five years ago, we sold 20% of the company to a Singapore investor, mm -hmm. um, so a private equity firm. Um, and it, absolutely, that helped us step up. Yes. That helped fund, our, and it's very modest, that helped fund our confidence, if you like, mm -hmm. to break into the Asian market. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was strategically for that. Um, I, look, um, yeah, absolutely, their connections. But but um, at that particular time, you know, the global financial crisis was oh, on. Oh, yes, yes, that was a tough um, time. It was a yes. bit of a win-win. They were really yep. prepared to invest in the Australian market. Mm -hmm. uh, it helped them. Um, so it was a match, a, a bit of a match made in heaven. Mm -hmm. So it really did help us. And now, you know, we're, we're ready at, to step up to the next level now because of that journey. Yes. So everything, you know, I think should be done in bite-sized pieces. I'm not, I'm not a great believer or a fan in this massive kind of success overnight. Yes. It's yes. not real. Or, or taking money when you're desperate. Yeah, exactly. It's the worst time to take money, I find, because people 
give away their heart. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've never we've never been desperate. I mean, the thing is, is that we we run the business based on a going concern, mm-hmm. a strong business, and we reinvest every penny into the business. So you know, as soon as there is a spare hundred bucks, I'll 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 go hire someone. Yes. Yeah. So um, maybe more than a hundred dollars. You know <laughs> what I mean. In these days in Australia, yes. <laughs> um, so, so what would you uh, say to people setting up businesses today? You know, what what they, should they be looking out for? What should they be doing? Yeah. Well, look. I mean, Canberra is a fantastic place to be a startup because there are there is this fantastic ecosystem of people who've been there and done that and who are willingly stepping forward to support their journey. And and that's one thing that we never had. We yes. never had that network and that ecosystem. So I'm a great advocate and supporter of the innovation network. Um, and the ACG government has been fabulous in listening to, to you know, the needs of the startup community and innovative companies. Um, so they're a great supporter. Um, and they've done what they can. You know, it would yes. be fabulous if there was a $100 million fund or whatever it is. But, Maybe. You know, we're a small city and um, whilst, you know, we absolutely need them to double and triple and keep investing in, in this um, seed funding that is needed, um, I... You know, there's a, a wonderful time to be starting a business right now. Yes. Um, you know, my, my, it's funny. My, my mum and dad were my, my greatest inspiration, you know, and, and Phil's parents were the same. You know, very modest, working-class mm-hmm. family. And my mum always used to say to me, why don't you go and get a real job? <laughs> <laughs> and it just, you know, kind of back then, it wasn't the thing to do to, no. to not have a boss. Mm-hmm. You know, and I and it, but it's always a good question because you know Phil and I always thought, oh well, if it doesn't work out, we could go get a real job. Yes. <laughs> and that was like your insurance policy that you had in your top drawer because you knew you'd be a great asset to, you know, the right company. Mm-hmm. Um, and and so you just slept easy at night knowing, you know, through those dark days, you know, it's hard. It is thinking, oh well, I can always go off and get a real job, but I'm never going to do that. <laughs> never never yes well I guess you know I, I think Canberra is a little bit underrated as a as a centre for starting up businesses in Australia today and I think in some ways it's a good thing I like that we're underrated because it means a lot of things happen here under the radar um, and the network is still reasonably small so you can connect to a lot of really good people quite quickly whereas mm-hmm. Sydney it's a little bit bigger it's a little mm-hmm. bit more commercial yep. it costs a bit more to connect to people yeah so um uh, I'm seeing a lot of startups though so following the, I suppose, the lean startup model, the, the thing that you must, you know, follow, you, you prove your product, you get angel funding, you get VC funding, and then you go to the US. <laughs> so what, what, what would you say to Has people? Has anyone ever done that? Well, I, I think a few people <laughs> oh, have. Yeah, a few, but... A few like, people have, but like, I think there is really? a lot of different routes to the market. <laughs> and what, what would you say? You know, would, you, would you say people should try and follow that methodology? They should follow their own heart or they should do something different or yeah it's a really good question actually and and you know there's conferences on every day that that talk about that right um yeah i think you're right and i think that if if australia can get itself organized around that early stage funding uh, i think that'll make a lot of difference and that you definitely don't need to leave and go to the u.s but you need to be able to be present in the mm-hmm. u.s Yes. Uh, we're proudly headquartered in Canberra, um, and we're here because of the type of people that we are. Mm-hmm. We value our family, we value our lifestyle, we love this city. Yes. And I, you, honestly, you, you know, I travel the world, right? And Toronto, Singapore, New York, Dallas, you know, we're, you name it. Yes. I, I, I would never live anywhere else because this is part of a lifestyle choice. So you'd have to have a pretty hard edge if you were prepared to move to Silicon Valley because it's a dysfunctional mm-hmm. city. Yes. Yeah, dog eat dog. Yeah, it's it tough. It's not mm-hmm. what you think it is. No. Um, you know, you you would, the, the skills shortage, if you like, or the battle for skills is intense, and it breeds a kind of arrogance and a, a and a kind of. Um, it's palatable in the air that um, 
you know, the, the, the competitive espionage, the, the poaching of staff. It's all, it, there's a hard edge to it. Yes. Um, and I don't subscribe to that. Hmm. And I think that us being far, far, far away from that is an asset to us. And if you just look at our friends over the ditch in New Zealand, at how far, far away they are from the rest of the world and how sophisticated their innovation network is. Yes. And the consumption by, by their supply chain of innovation is also sophisticated. Yes. So, you know, we, I would rather go there than go to North America. Yeah, I think, I think they've used their culture and applied that to the way they innovate and they've developed their own model for doing this. Honestly, science 101, right? Mm-hmm. You think about it, you think, hmm. So in, in an ecosystem, you've got your sharks and you've got your minnows and you've got your pond, right? You think about how that works in Silicon Valley. Here is a subset of, of that pond far, far away that are less likely to copy, less likely to, to poach, yes. less likely to be influenced by though that DNA over there and so it's a bit like the Galapagos Islands mm-hmm. right you, you evolve differently and yes. you evolve under your own influence and your own ideas and your own effort um, and so you get something unique and special right? yes and th- that still works right and that's the important uh, absolutely thing. Yeah, and, and, and arguably works better yes it's a stronger yes. better gene pool yes. than this that can cannibalize itself really quickly or or that the gene crosses over and actually doesn't evolve yes right <laughs> science 101 <laughs> okay well thank you very much for your time today Michelle um, it's been a great conversation um, as a as a 25 year startup you know <laughs> I, I suppose you're an example of where organizations can get to with yeah. with with uh, enough time enough energy and enough focus on what on their heart and what they're trying to achieve. Yeah, exactly. So I uh, appreciate the time. Thank you Thank very you much. Thank you very much. Great to meet you.